Uh, welcome to lecture six of the Introduction to Computing course. Um, let us start by a quick review of the previous lecture, lecture number five, and then we'll go on to uh, some of the topics that I hope to cover today, which include uh, continuing on from where we left off in terms of binary encoding, and we'll talk about hexadecimals. And then we'll take a sort of a broad look at the uh, hardware technology as well. So we'll sort of go down the abstraction there to vacuum tubes, to all the way to microchips. We'll talk more about transistors, logic gates, and logic circuits, time permitting. So let's take a quick look at the uh, previous lecture. We spoke about uh, iterative algorithms. Uh, we then spoke about recursive algorithms, algorithms which are defined by themselves, by calling themselves. And we looked at how a queue versus a stack uh, operates. And then we saw that recursive algorithms are actually using a stack rather than a queue, okay? And then we, based on that, we try to determine the space complexity and the time complexity, in particular, the space complexity of recursive algorithms. And we saw that the space complexity for the first time is now changing in the recursive algorithm. So it's no longer uh, order uh, constant, but actually depends on the size of the number that you're trying to calculate the factorial of, okay? Um, and then we talked about abstraction. Uh, the concept is a very general one. And we spoke about how, uh, if you are, for example, uh, talking about your own car, uh, how abstraction uh, plays an important role over there. And we'll talk more about abstraction uh, today as well. Uh, but basically uh, the, the concept is that you are focusing on a particular layer. And if you are, for example, talking about pre uh, teaching somebody how to drive a car, you want to make sure that you are talking, you are uh, describing things at that particular abstract layer and not going into unnecessary details of uh, lower abstraction layers, for example, how the engine works or how you know, electrons and protons work uh, all the way down into the physics layer. Similarly, when we're talking about the algorithms, we'll be talking about uh, flow charts. Uh, when we're down to the um, a particular programming language, we will look at that particular abstract layer. And today we will actually dive deeper down and we'll go into a much lower layer, uh, abstraction layer, and we will talk about the hardware level. And actually we go down fairly deep today. Um, and then this will probably be one of the few times that we'll go down to the hardware level. Uh, so we looked under the hood last time and we spoke about different types of memories uh, and then the size of the memories. And we talked about how data is actually encoded uh, on a computer and we spoke about bytes and kilobytes. Uh, one of the things that we showed you is the ASCII uh, conversion chart. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on that uh, because one of the things we're going to be talking about today is this uh, term over here, which is called a hex, okay? Now, if you look at the, uh, the chart that we showed you last time, you see that uh, every byte is displayed over here as a binary byte. Uh, and this is quite a mouthful. So for example, if I refer to as a, for example, I said that H, the letter H in ASCII is represented by this particular binary, okay? Now, this is a sequence of eight bits. So if I were to describe H as a binary number, it would be zero, one, double, zero, one triple zero. So that's quite a mouthful and maybe not the most appropriate way of referring to a binary number. Another way which is quite uh, useful and often used is the hexadecimal notation, okay? And the hexadecimal notation basically uh, breaks up the byte into two what are called nibbles, okay? So the first uh, portion zero one double zero is referred to the number four as the number four, okay? And the second, uh, okay, again, we're having some disturbance from people who are joining in and their mics are not muted. So please make sure your mics are muted. Um, and then for the second nibble, the one triple zero is represented by the number eight. So we'll take a closer look at this and how uh, those two um, are determined. 
So um, we looked at binary encoding last time and we saw how binary uh, numbers are basically similar to decimal numbers. The only difference being that here the decimal numbers are base 10 and here the binary numbers are to the base two, okay? The rest of the encoding is similar. It's two to the power zero, one, two, and, and so on, instead of 10 to the power zero, one, two, and so on, okay? And today when we look at the hexadecimal, we realize that instead of two, it is replaced by um, 16, okay? So it uses the base 16 over there. So let's take a look at hexadecimals now. So this was floating point numbers that we looked at last time. And we saw how floating numbers can be calculated as well. Okay. So that was the revision. Those were the revision slides. I remember I indicate them with the letter R at the top of the slide. Um, so let's start today's session. Hexadecimals. Now, what are hexadecimals? As I already introduced them, they're basically used as a base 16 reference. So um, you'll see that uh, a, a byte uh, can be broken up into two nibbles. So this is here a byte. Uh, it comprises of four higher order bits and four what you might refer to as lower order bits, okay? So um, now, each one of these nibbles can, uh, can basically be represented by a single symbol. So if you have all zeros, you can represent it by the decimal number zero. And then uh, clearly uh, one can be represented by one. A uh, one zero can be represented by the decimal number two and so on, okay? So this is simply the binary encoding. Um, when you get to one zero one zero, as you can see, this is one um, eight and one two, okay? Uh, so just before that, when you have one zero zero one, this corresponds to one eight and one one. And of course that adds up to number nine, okay? Now, um, as you notice that as we go down uh, for the first um, 10 numbers, we have decimal numbers, okay? So we can represent them by the decimal number zero to nine. Now, um, if you want to have a shorthand notation for this number, which is basically the number 10, um, you could represent, you could write it down as 10, but that's not very convenient because you want to have a single character which represents that number. So um, naturally uh, people thought of, let's represent that by the letter A, okay? So the number 11, which corresponds to an eight, plus a uh, two plus a one, so eight, nine, 10, 11, that is shown by the symbol B. And then we continue on C, D, E, and F, okay? So you can see that using uh, four digits, the maximum number that you can represent would be an eight and a four and a two and a one. So all of those would add up to 15, okay? so. A nibble can represent any number between zero till 15. And so we will represent a nibble by one of the following symbols, one of the hex symbols from zero till F, okay? So if I go back to the chart, what you'll notice is that wherever you see the hex column, uh, you will see the numbers, um, either decimal numbers, or you might see letters A, B, C, D, E, and F, okay? You won't find any number which is larger than, uh, which, you won't find any alphabet which is larger than F, okay? So, um, so, ne so let's take uh, a few examples to see if we understand the hexadecimal notation. So uh, the number um, 00, uh, the, the binary number 0001, 0011, clearly, clearly corresponds to the hex hexadecimal notation 13, why? Because we're going to represent the lower order bits as three because this is clearly a two plus a one. And this is uh, clearly simply a one. So this corresponds to a one and this corresponds to a three, okay? So can somebody tell me what uh, would be the hex hexadecimal notation for this byte? Hello, my name is here, zero F. Uh, Omar, so that would be a zero F, okay? That's very good, uh, clearly because all ones correspond to uh, the letter F in hexadecimal notation. Any other uh, thoughts? What about this notation? 
जोहेब मुगल सर वन टू जी जोहेब सर वन एंड टू वन एंड टू वेरी गुड ओके सो वी गॉट दैट स्ट्रेट एंड आउट आई होप देर इज नो कंफ्यूजन एज फार एज दैट इज कंसर्न लेट्स डू सम मोर एग्जाम्पल्स now uh when you go into um into python you can use the notation 0x to represent a binary number okay and when we use print statement it will actually print it out as a decimal number okay so can somebody tell me uh when i say print 0x 0f what would be the output of this python statement and how would you convert that now remember that uh, each one of these uh, numbers over here in the binary notation corresponded to 2 to the power 0 2 to the power 1 to the power 2 and so on right but in hexadecimal notation the first character will correspond to 16 to the power 0 and the second character will correspond to 16 to the power 1 okay so if i'm writing the uh, hexadecimal number 0f okay 0f um that should be calculated by taking um the number f that the number the decimal number that corresponds to f and multiplying it by 16 to power 0 and then taking the number 0 and multiplying it by 16 to the power 1 so uh, let me help you out over here f corresponds to what corresponds to the number 15 over here okay so this should uh, print out what number so we what we going to do is we going to take 15 times 16 to the power 0 and 16 to the power 0 is clearly 1 so we going to take 15 times 1 plus 0 times 16 to the power 1 okay so we going to add these two numbers and what should we get as a result of this print statement Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, so that's obvious. Now, can somebody tell me what would you get if you try to print the statement zero x one two? Sir, am I am I there? Seventeen. Humor. Okay, so you're saying there should be seventeen. Can you tell me how you calculated that? Multiply two by sixteen to the power of zero, and then one by sixteen to the power of one, and then add both of them. Okay, so how much is that? So it should be two times sixteen to the power one plus, sorry, um, one times sixteen to the power one plus two times two times sixteen to the power zero. So how much is that? Seventeen, sir. Okay, that's pretty good. Sixteen plus two is seventeen. That's sir, new. Eighteen, sir. Okay. So sometimes we forget our arithmetic. All right, we get too complicated. When it gets too complex, we forget our math, basic arithmetic. Okay, so, um, so that's eighteen, not seventeen. Okay, so hopefully everybody got that. So let's continue. How would you calculate um, the print statement, the output of zero x one 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 one? Now notice that earlier we had two uh, hexadecimal characters, one and two. Now we have four hexadecimal characters. So how are you going? How are you going to calculate that? Okay, so let me repeat. Zero x represents that uh, this is a hexadecimal number. Okay, so if I simply said print and I and I didn't put in the hexadecimal, so if I said print and I said print one two, then it would assume that this number is. By definition, a decimal number, so it would simply print twelve. Okay, but when you put in zero x before that, that's a special notation in Python, and it indicates that this number, these two characters, are supposed to be treated as hexadecimal. Okay, so it's going to treat them as base base sixteen. Okay, so let's continue on. How would one calculate this number? So let's so say it's four three six nine. Or tell me how you calculated that rather than the the result. How would you calculate this? Sir, it would be sixteen cube. Ah, uh, name sixteen. Ramar. Ji. It would be sixteen cube plus sixteen square plus sixteen power one and plus sixteen. Exactly. So it's basically 
sum of all yeah. of these, right? Because we basically multiply each one of these. So it's one plus 16 plus 16 squared plus 16 cubed. And you've calculated that to be uh, what, coming out to what? Somebody got that anyway, uh, but that's simple uh, arithmetic. So uh, let's, let's do this one as well. How would you calculate this? Somebody tell me the, uh, the expression for calculating the second uh, zero x one two three four into the power of three plus name, name please Omar Ahmed Omar go ahead yeah yeah sir one into sixteen to the power of three yeah plus two into sixteen to the power of two yeah. plus six three into sixteen to the power of one plus yeah. four into sixteen to the power of zero yeah very good excellent so that's how you calculate that let's do one more before we move on. Uh, how would we calculate this? Sir, Bilal ta hai. Ji, Bilal. Uh, 10 into 10 to the power six, uh, 10 into 16 to the power 3 multiple plus 11 into 16 to the power 2 plus 12 into 16 to the power 1 and plus 13 into 16 to the power 0. Very good. I think that's right. So A is a 10. Okay, so it's basically 10 and then B and C and D. Okay, very good. So I think people have gotten it. Um, let's see if I have done, uh, I've got the same results over here. And hopefully if you calculate it, you should get these numbers. Okay, so I think uh, that is a quick introduction to the hexadecimal notation. Um, we, we will probably be using this as we go forward uh, in this course. So just make sure you, you've got it right. Now, um, We've talked about encoding. Uh, yes. G, G, go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, say that again. I didn't quite get your question. Uh, no, so, the, so, so F, it, you will never go beyond F. So as I said, every hexadecimal decimal, uh, number will only comprise of the following symbols from zero till F, okay? And the reason is that the hexadecimal notation is based on nibbles, okay? And the maximum number that you can have in one nibble is 15. That's represented by the, by the letter F, okay? So the short answer is no, you would never have, you would never see a number uh, zero X uh, G H, okay? Uh, it simply will give you a, a, an error. You can try that out in Python. It will not accept it, okay? But it, it, it will accept any numbers between zero and uh, F, okay? So any other questions regarding the hexadecimal, hexadecimal notation before we move on? Um, Assam, sir. Ji. Tariq Iqbal. Ji, Tariq. Um, so through this method, we can print the decimal, uh, bring, print the hexadecimal uh, version, the decimal version. Yeah, so we, you, can, you can use this print statement and with a zero X notation to print any hexadecimal number into binary, into decimal, okay? Into decimal, right? Yeah, into decimal. It's not binary, it's decimal. It so can we, you, can, we, can we somehow print it into binary in Python? Okay, uh, I'm sure there is a technique. I haven't looked it up, but if you go online and go into Google and say, how do I print um, uh, hexadecimal into binary or hex or and vice versa and so on, uh, it should be possible. Okay, uh, I haven't checked it out, but then I'm sure there is a way. Okay, good question though. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so now let me ask you a broader question and let me specifically ask this from those of you who've actually taken a computer science course before. As to why is binary so important? I mean, we started talking about binary, but um, somehow it was assumed that uh, we're going to be using binary numbers. And you've always, uh, you know, whenever we talk about digital and, you know, computers and online stuff, you always hear that everything is digital, everything is binary inside a computer, okay? Except of course, if some of you are familiar with quantum computing, that's a whole new ball game, but uh, let's not talk about quantum computing. Let's just stick to the regular computing. Uh, why is binary so important? And- Please, Arlesh. Please, Arlesh. 
Sir, so computer uh, computes everything, every every data in zero one form. So binary is used, and binary is in the form of zero. Okay, very good. So that's the straightforward answer is that computers simply use zeros and ones. Internally, if you were able to open up a computer's memory or hard disk, then you wouldn't find uh, decimal numbers. You wouldn't find hexadecimal numbers. Everything is either going to be a zero or one, okay? So that's the simplest and the most straightforward answer. Um, anything beyond that, uh, can somebody give a sir, deep oh, here. Uh, sir, and, oh, and I would appreciate, yeah, I would also appreciate if other people can also answer, but go ahead, Omar. Uh, sir, the computer processor consists of transistors, which usually takes uh, inputs in ones and zeros. So that's why the computer calculates all the things in zeros and ones. Okay, very excellent. So basically, you've sort of jumped ahead, and this is actually going to be the major topic of today's lecture. Is that as Umar has just said, that computers internally have something called transistors. Okay. Uh, please make sure that your mic is muted, otherwise you're going to be disturbing everybody else. Um, is yeah, thank you. So um, internally, um, there are there are things called transistors. Okay, and what is a transistor? That's going to be the topic of today's lecture. So let's uh, take a closer look and try to find out why are things internally represented as binary. Okay. So in order to be able to understand that, I'm going to take um, um, you know a deep dive into. A, a much lower abstract abstraction there. So we're going to start with the actual hardware, okay? And if you understand some of the hardware background, hopefully by the end of this lecture today, you'll understand, you'll get a better appreciation as to why things are all digital or, or by all binary inside computers, okay? So let me go into a little bit of history. So um, if we look at the history of computing, there was a very watershed moment, which was if you if you can if you can split up computing into two periods, then I would say um, everything before 1947 and everything after 1947, these are the two major epochs in computing. Okay, so it wasn't like uh, computers didn't exist before 1947, but computers, uh, the technology, the fundamental technology drastically changed in 1947 with the invention of something called a transistor, okay? And I'm showing you here a picture of what a modern transistor looks like. Some of you might have seen this in electronic circuits and so on, if you ever opened up any digital circuit. And um, transistors, when they combine together, they form integrated circuits. Integrated circuits, if you combine a large number of them into small and smaller uh, chips, then they become microchips, okay? So we'll take a, a closer look at that. And some of the modern chips today comprise of trillions of transistors on a single chip. And each one of these chips is something that you can hold in your hand. It's like an inch by an inch or, you know, you've probably seen these. Now, what happened before transistors were invented? It wasn't like uh, computers weren't, didn't exist. Um, excuse me, I think I have a phone call coming in. Let me try to turn that off. Okay, I'm going to turn my mobile off. Sorry for that interruption. Okay, so um, if you looked at the period before 1947, it wasn't like computers didn't exist, okay? In fact, if you look at one of the first computers, the ENIAC, which was actually made in 1946, it was extremely huge and it consisted of using vacuum tubes, okay? And these vacuum tubes were very much, they behaved similar to transistors, okay? But what was the major difference? The major difference was the underlying technology that was used, okay? Vacuum tubes, uh, both of these, th bo both vacuum tubes and transistors behave the same way, okay? And they behaved in, in what is referred to as a switch. They basically turned things on and off, okay? But uh, the technology was very different. So this was using vacuum tubes. And, uh, people who are familiar with that, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these vacuum tubes basically created a glass and inside there was vacuum. And basically by putting a little bit of current over here, they were able to turn things on and off, okay? Now in 1947, uh, three uh, folks uh, at Bell Labs uh, invented the transistor, the modern transistor. 
and they used a special technology which is called semiconductors. Okay, so the term semiconductor, I don't know if people are familiar with this, is an extremely important term because this is actually the, the basis of modern computing. Okay, and everything from 1947 onwards used semicon semiconductors. Okay, now you might say, what exactly is a semiconductor, right? You, you know what a conductor is, a metal is a conductor. You know what a non-conductor is, for example, a cloth is a non-conductor, but what's a semiconductor, okay? So semiconductors were uh, something which was created, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but these are things which were made out of silicon, and by changing their properties, their, their chemical properties, you could convert them either into a conductor or a non-conductor, okay? So just by changing the way the chemical properties are of that, of that uh, of the silicon, you were able to change its uh, conducting properties. So that was a fantastic uh, discovery, okay? And this shows you the first uh, invention of the transistor. And somehow over here, uh, there will be the actual semiconductor, which was used and the rest of it is actually uh, connecting to it. It looks like a vacuum tube, but it's not, okay? But it's basically using a new technology. So um, everything uh, after 1947, started using semiconductors. And the nice properties of these semiconductors was that you could actually make them smaller and smaller, okay? And um, obviously uh, vacuum tubes, you couldn't make them smaller, okay? In fact, uh, these vacuum tubes used so much heat that they actually every once in a while they would burst, okay? And they would burn out. And people, uh, you know, people like this would actually spend a lot of time actually replacing these vacuum tubes. And uh, if people are familiar with the term debugging, uh, debugging, uh, you know, in modern terminology, it simply means that you've got a bug in the software and a bug simply means that you, there's some error in the code, okay? But in the days of the ENIAC, there was an actual meaning to debugging. Uh, and bugs, you know, refer to um, actual creatures, right? Uh, flying creatures, moths and things like that. So what used to happen in those days is that uh, moths would get attracted to the heat and to the light and they would go inside the vacuum tubes and they would, as a result, would burn out the vacuum tube, okay? So the term debugging actually physically meant that you had to take, figure out where the actual moth or you know, uh, some other creature, flying creature, a fly or something was inside the circuitry. So that's where the term debugging came in, okay? Just a little bit of history for you. Um, so now let's take a look at what exactly is a transistor. Okay, so if I were to compare it um, with something like a tap, okay? So a tap is very simple. You have a knob over here, okay? And using the knob, you can change the flow of water, okay? So the water is coming in from C and it's going out from E. If you turn, this, uh, if you turn the tap off, the, the water stops flowing. If you turn the, the, the tap on, the water starts flowing, okay? So it's sort of like a switch. You can simply turn it on and off. Okay, so it has three inputs or three terminals, you might say. One is the place where things are coming in. So C is where the, the water is coming in. E is where the water is going out and B is where you're actually controlling it, okay? Now, a transistor actually has these three uh, terminals as well. Uh, this is referred to as a base um, and collectors and emitters, but I don't want to confuse you because these are things which are more relevant to uh, the double E's, the electrical engineers, but just refer to it as C, B, and E, okay? So what happens is that the transistor can have two modes. It can either have um, an on mode, okay? So you can say this is on and this is off, okay? So this is sort of like your, your tap. Uh, in a normal tap, you can actually have it half open, but uh, in a transistor, you don't do that. You can either, either turn it completely on or completely off. So the, either the water will be flowing at full throttle or it won't be flowing at all. It's not going to be like the you know, faucet which you have in your uh, in homes, which you can turn it half on, okay? So that's why uh, it's basically an on-off switch. So if you think about the, the input uh, to B, which is basically your, your tap, you can either have it, for example, at different voltages. So folks who've studied physics, hopefully, know uh, what a signal is. So you, your input signal could be either a zero volt or it could be a five volt. So for example, this could be a digital signal. So when it's zero volts, when you apply zero volts over here, 
what happens is that it becomes an open circuit. Okay, so this is B is zero volts, and this becomes an open circuit. So in other words, C and B are disconnected. Okay, if C and B are disconnected, clearly the current can't flow. Okay, so this is the flow of current, which is flowing from C and E. The current stops flowing by making B zero volts. You can actually change the proper change the flow of current between C and E. Okay, if you make B five volts or some higher voltages then in a sense, you've short-circuited this, okay? You've closed the circuit and now current can flow from C to B, okay? So this is sort of similar to your tap. By putting a five volts at B, you're basically turning the tap on and the water is flowing from C to E or in an actual circuit, the current is flowing from C to E. If you turn B to zero volts or turn it off, then the current stops flowing, okay? So this is all that a transistor is. and Believe it or not, the simple switch, the simple component is the basis of for all computing today, okay? And if it hadn't been for the invention of the semiconductor to be able to make this into, not into a tap or a vacuum tube, but to be able to make this into something called a semiconductor, that has totally changed computing, okay? So I hope this is clear. Is, does anybody, is anybody confused about the operation of a transistor? Um, if yes, this is the time to speak. Okay, good. So uh, hopefully that is fairly clear. Now, uh, the, the next question is, can we use the simple, um, simple um, transistor or simple on-off switch to actually make something more complex? Okay. And so the next question that I have is that, can you convert it into something called a logical gate? or a logical not gate, okay? So logical not gate is represented by this, uh, by this symbol over here, okay? So it's simply uh, something like this with a uh, bubble in the front. You can have an input over here, A and output B. And the idea is that when A is zero, you want the output to be opposite, okay? So now we're switching to binary, or you could represent it by, you could have a representation of the binary as five volts. So when the input A is zero volts, you want the output to be five volts. And five volts, we're going to refer to that as a one, okay? And when the input is five volts or a one, we want the output to be zero volts, okay? So people who've studied physics, and I hope everybody has got a physics background uh, when you come into computer science at IBM. Uh, can somebody tell me how could one use this transistor and make a logical circuit which will actually have this operation that when you enter a zero volts over here, okay, we want the output to be five volts. And when the input is five volts, we want the output to be zero volts. We want to reverse it. So it's, it's not obvious and it does require a little bit of a slightly complex circuitry, an electronic circuit, you might say. For those of you who studied electronic circuits and physics, uh, any suggestions? Dead silence. Uh, Tariq is one. Uh, Samir. Ji Tariq. Uh, put it parallelly, I guess, and divert the flow of current when you when you want to, you know, you want it to be flipped. Okay, so I'm not sure if exactly follow, but yeah, Samid, that's a good uh, good attempt. Uh, Samit, go ahead. So we can use a diode. Okay, we can use a diode. Okay, so actually um, in electronics, you might've studied something called a diode. Now a transistor is actually the basis of a diode. Okay, so we're even below a diode. Diode is actually comprised of transistors. All right, interesting for you. So every uh, modern circuitry is actually comprised of transistors. Now the question is, if you're saying you're going to use a diode, actually then it boils down to a diode consists of a transistor and how do you use a transistor to convert uh, a, a signal into the opposite signal? Uh, any other? Uh, sir, sir, Omar Ahmed here. Yeah. Omar, Omar. Sir, we can use a single transistor along with multiple of resistors to make it a NOT gate. Okay, very good. So can you try to describe what that, uh, how would you, what would you connect E to, and what would you connect C to, and what would you connect B to? You have three terminals. 
in the transistor, okay? And this is, so now this is going back to this transistor. We have three terminals over here, C, B, and E. And now I want you to take this physical transistor, uh, connect it to uh, resistors and try to convert and maybe voltages and to see if you can make a circuit which will actually have this operation of converting the signal to the opposite. Uh, sir, maybe uh, try to pass the input of from A to through a resistor R2 to okay, Q1, so the main R, uh, the main circuit, and then the above input to R resistor R1 to VCC, and then the below input to okay, the so R resistor. Okay, so, so just go a little slow. So you're saying connect the input, uh, uh, connect the input. What, which input do we connect to the resistor over here? Uh, A. Oh, there is no our main input. Okay, our so, main yeah, input. okay, right. Take it. So A is connected to the resistor, um, some resistor R, and we connect it to this um, transistor. Okay, and then what? Yes. The and transistor C element will connect to another resistor. Okay. All right. Yeah. And from between the C and the R resistor, there will be an output going towards B. Okay, so maybe something over here. Okay, very yes. Good. Okay, and what do we connect E to? To main power. To what? Power supply, main type of power supply. Power supply, so plus five volts? Uh, yes, uh, maybe. And what about this? What do we connect to this? Uh, sir, this to, I think, sir, I'm not concerned about this. And Okay, so you've almost got it right, but let me show you the actual circuit, okay? So the, the mistake that you're making, well, you, it will actually work, but do something else, okay? So we normally connect this to zero volts to the, what is referred to as ground, okay? And we connect this to the plus power supply, plus five volts, okay? So let's take a look at the circuit. I've just drawn it over here on the next uh, uh, slide. So this is exactly what you're talking about, except I've made it a little bit simpler. I haven't shown the resistor over here. Uh, let's just assume that you're directly connecting it to the base over here. And, um, and this is the C of the collect of the transistor and we're connecting it to the resistor, as you said, we're connecting this to plus five volts and we're connecting to this to zero volts, okay? So this is our circuit, okay? I hope uh, people are recalling this from their basic physics, okay? So now let's see what happens when, uh, and we know the basic uh, operation of a transistor. We know that a transistor, when you connect a zero volts over here, it will open the circuit. And when you connect five volts over here, it will short circuit these two points, okay? So that's the basic function of a transistor. Now let's try to go forward and see um, what's going to happen. So um, when I'm going to put um, a zero volt, okay? So when I'm putting a zero volt, it's going to become open circuit, okay? So what that basically means is that there's no current going to be flowing over here. There's no current simply because uh, this circuit is open. So the five volt is not going to allow, is not going to be connected to the earth over here. And so there's going to be no circuit flowing. So if there's no circuit flowing, can somebody tell me what will be the voltage over here at B? People who remember the physics. Um, I think Heather, you're trying to speak. Somebody else? I think it will be zero volt. Okay, so uh, I think Muhammad, something has said that it's going to be zero words. Anybody uh, agrees or disagrees? Sir, Zuhayb Mughal, I think it will be five volt. Okay, Zuhayb says that this will be five volts. Zuhayb, can you explain why? Sir, because the other side is closed, so the current fl starts flowing in that direction, B, towards B. Uh, okay, so it's going to start flowing here. Uh, actually, this current is very small, so you'll assume that there is no current here. Um, so if there's no current here, remember there's an equation called V is equal to IR, okay? So the voltage drop across a resistor is proportional to the current, okay? So if you have the voltage drop between these two points, then it's proportional to the current and proportional to the resistor, 
Okay, if you don't remember this equation, just go back to your physics. If the current is zero, then there is no voltage drop across it. Okay, so if there is no voltage drop across these two points, then this voltage has to be equal to this voltage. Okay, so the output is going to be equal to five volts. So you've got the answer right. Um, perhaps you had a little confusion about um, the reasoning, but your answer is correct. Okay, so when you enter when you when a is the input is zero volts this becomes open circuit and so there's no current flowing and so the output goes up to five volts whatever you put in over here this is 12 volts this will become 12 volts okay because there is no current flowing over here now let's look at the other situation what about when a is equal to five volts then this becomes a short circuit okay now what's going to be the voltage over here Zero. Very good. Uh, who said zero? Mars. Mars. Can you explain that? Why is it going to be zero? Any any thoughts as to why there's going to be zero? Well, it should be kind of because hard. the other point is earthed, so yeah. all, all of the voltage will be used across the resistor. Yes, so when right. it gets to the point where the current is diverting, it won't have any potential left. Absolutely right. So basically what you're saying is that since B is now short circuited to the ground, okay, there is no potential drop between these two points. So B has to be clearly equal to zero volts. And all the potential drop will be across these two points and there'll be five volt drop, okay? So you've seen that by having a transistor, which is basically what it's doing is by, cert by putting a certain voltage over here, you can either make it open circuit or closed circuit. You can actually create what is called a logical gate, okay? You can take an input and reverse it. You put in zero volt and the output magically comes out to be five volts. You put in five volts and the output magically comes out to be zero volt, it's inverted. So that is the fundamentals of modern computers. I mean, something as simple as that is right at the heart of computing today, okay? So with this simple circuit, you can actually make far more complex circuits, okay? For example, if you, um, if you next want to make something more complex, um, you can make, and I'll talk about more complex circuits shortly as well, okay? But you can also make memory circuits. For example, you can put some of the circuits together and to be able to save data. It, now that's not quite obvious as to how you would save data because this is simply converting something into its opposite, right? But using the circuitry and combining it in complex ways, you can actually have it say, uh, uh, also remember what you put in, okay? And we'll get to that at a later stage. So I hope everybody is clear about how you could create, um, you could use um, a little bit of electronic circuitry along with the transistor, okay? You combine the, the electronic circuitry uh, uh, with some resistors, some voltages, and all of a sudden you have something which can convert an input. If you have essentially a zero, it will become a one. If you enter a one, it will become a zero, okay? And these will normally correspond to voltages. So one would correspond to five volt and zero would correspond to zero volt and vice versa, okay? So I hope this is clear to everybody. Um, and if so, let's move on. Now, um, having made uh, a basic circuit um, out of semiconductors, now uh, semiconductors have evolved over the years. And there's something called a Moore's law, okay? And this was uh, the CEO of Intel, which was on the earliest uh, integrated circuit companies in Silicon Valley, um, which uh, produced, uh, you know, memory chips and so on, we started producing integrated chips. And uh, Moore, uh, the gentleman Moore, noticed that there is something which explains the growth of this industry, okay? And I'll explain from my personal experience that uh, I moved back from the States in 1992, okay? After working and uh, studying in the US. And the first computer that I purchased had a capacity of, in 1992, at a capacity of 200 megabyte, okay, on the hard disk. Um, today, if I look at the kind of computing power that you have, 
uh, in 2020, you can get, typically if you buy a computer, uh, it can be uh, terabytes on, of hard disk, okay? And Moore's law basically says that uh, this is an observation, okay? And he simply observed that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit, and what's an IC, I'll explain that in a, a shortly, doubles every two years, okay? And that's a phenomenal, uh, Sorry, let me also turn my other mobile off. People seem to be remembering me today. Okay. Um, so uh, Moore's law is quite phenomenal because it's talking about exponential growth. And people who are familiar with there's an old story that you know there was a king and um, he had somebody uh, who came up to him and he said that. Um, um, you know, he did something fantastic and the king wanted to reward him. And so this person said that, I don't ask for much. I simply want you to take a chessboard and I want you to put a single grain of rice on the first piece of, of, of the chessboard and then to keep doubling it. So on the second piece, I want you to put two pieces of rice and the third one, I want to put four pieces of rice and so on. And the king was kind of said, you know, this is a really silly request. I mean, he's asking for nothing. He's just asking for a bag of rice. And so he asked his, you know, his assistants to get the ba a bag of rice. And he said, okay, let's give it to him. And they, said, they started putting this up. And very quickly, they realized that, um, you know, after uh, filling out maybe half the chess board, um, the bag of rice was gone. Okay. So, so they said, let's get some more rice. And then because you're doubling um, the amount of rice um, in every piece, so it had an exponential impact. And when you have an exponential impact, things grow very rapidly. As you can see in this, in this curve over here, it grows very rapidly. So the, the, long, uh, the, the short of the long story is that very soon the, the king realized that he doesn't have enough rice in his entire kingdom to be able to satisfy this guy's request. So he did what was natural. He probably decapitated the person okay, to get rid of him. I'm not sure what happened, but basically that's the moral of the story is that is that um, you know ex when you have exponential growth in any field, then the numbers become extremely large very quickly. Okay, so uh, starting from 200 megabytes uh, today, there are three terabytes of data, and in the years to come, it's going to keep on doubling. That's what Moore uh, and Moore's law is phenomenal in that it has it has been going on since the last 40, 50 years. Okay, so then so if we if you look at the actual, uh, this is from 1970s when Moore initially made his uh, prediction, all the way up till 2020. If you look at the actual, uh, and I've shown the prediction versus the actual, and this is in terms of microns, in terms of the size of the, uh, the semiconductor circuitry, it's been almost close to what Moore has been predicting. Okay, and uh, today there are uh, submicron level nanometer uh, thickness. Um, uh, uh, so integrated circuitry. And as a result of that, uh, today you have integrated circuits, microchips, which have trillions of transistors in a single chip, okay? So um, if you understand that, um, let's take a look at a little video that will sort of, you know, uh, give you a chance to appreciate this industry. And I hope you can hear the video on this. So let me play, it's a few minutes long and it will give you a little bit of an insight. It's a little dated, it's from 2014, but it basically tells you the basic idea behind this field. They are used in the electronic devices we use every day. Our computers, our phones, our televisions, and even our cars. They are microchips. Microchips are tiny electronic circuits. These small chips send and receive signals as electrical pulses and rapidly do complex calculations on these signals. The microchips inside your computer receive input when we type on a keyboard, move a mouse, or receive data from the internet. The microchip you're seeing now is from a normal desktop computer. The job of this chip is to act like an electronic middleman. The chip interprets input from another part of the computer like the keyboard, 
and sends this output to the main brains of the computer, a microchip called the central processing unit. As we zoom further in, we need to use a scanning electron microscope, or SCM, and the small gold wires will now appear to be huge white columns. These wires are the chip's link to the outside world. They provide power to the chip and also send signals to and from the chip. Now we see a well-organized landscape. The gridded pathways are tiny metal wires. Electrical pulses travel along these wires to go between different parts of the chip. These wires are the roads and highways of the microchip world. As we get closer, some pathways cross over others. This is because microchips are layered. This chip, which was made in the late 90s, has only four layers, while modern chips will have 12 or more. All these pathways lead to transistors, the basic building block of a microchip. From these simple building blocks, complex functionality can be built. For example, circuits that can add, subtract, multiply, or divide numbers. The pathways and transistors are about one micron or 1,000 nanometers across. The amazing thing is that by modern standards, this is huge. Newer chips often use transistors that are, are as small as 20 nanometers. So just to interrupt over here. So this is from 2014. Today, um, the, the width has come down to about two nanometers, okay? This means that if we removed one of the old one micron transistors, we could fit 2,500 modern transistors in its space. And it's a good thing that transistors are so tiny because a modern microchip in your laptop can contain over 1 billion transistors. And today, um, transistors have been made, uh, sorry, today chips have been made which have not 1 billion, but 1 trillion. Okay, so 1,000 times more than what was being talked about in this, okay? Advances in nanotechnology have not only made microchips smaller and faster, but also more energy efficient. Okay, so that sort of gives you an idea as to um, how the industry has progressed. And uh, the IT industry has, you know, the, the, the way in which it has progressed, if any other industry, for example, if the um, airline industry had progressed in the same way, it said that you would be able to travel from here to, you know, halfway around the world in seconds and with literally uh, no fuel. But um, there is no other industry which is actually comparable to the IT industry, okay? Simply because of the way semiconductors have been able to create transistors smaller and smaller, okay? So, uh, and if you're interested in how that technology is evolving, then you can you know, uh, look into that. There are lots of uh, YouTube videos on that, and uh, you can perhaps take an, an even a course in that area. There are you know, courses on very large scale uh, integrated circuits as well. Anyway, so let's go on. Um, now, what you can do is uh, you can, as I said, using a simple NOT gate, you can make more complex gates. So as was being talked about, you can make circuitry which can do additions, okay? Simple additions that are the, at the heart of computing. So let's try to see how that can be done, okay? So uh, let's say that um, these are the four, these are the three basic uh, gates that, um, that are used and all of these are made basically from these circuits, okay? So as you can see, the basic obvious uh, gates are the AND gates, OR gates, and something called the XOR gates, okay? So the AND gate is very simple, and it's often referred to as A times B, okay? And it simply means that you're ANDing these two uh, operations together. So if you have two inputs to this AND gate, so each one of them has two inputs, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that if both of them are one, the output is going to be one, but if any one of them is uh, input is zero, then the output is going to be a zero. Okay, so that's a simple AND operation. The OR operation sim is, sim is different in that if any one of them, if any either A or B are one, then the output is going to be a one. And if uh, naturally, if neither of them is, uh, is a one, then the output is going to be a zero, okay? The XOR is slightly different, okay? And it has uh, this uh, notation. So the AND is simply represented as shown over here. The OR is slightly pointed, something like this. 
and the XOR is simply has is like an OR gate, but it has an extra um, you know curvy line over here at the bottom. Now the XOR is slightly different. Does can somebody tell me what an XOR is if you've studied this? Sorry, it should be the inverse of OR, right? That okay. it uh, flips the inputs of OR, so it should be one and three zeros. Okay. Any other thoughts? So, um, Tariq is saying that it should an XOR is simply um, an reverse of the OR. Sir, Burhan, am I there? Ji, Burhan. Sir, uh, XOR basically says if both inputs are the same, then the answer should be false. The answer is what? If both inputs are same, then the answer should be false. Should be false. Okay, very good. So, in other words, it's similar. It's, it's similar to the OR gate, except that when both of these are one, then the output is forced to be zero. Okay, it's kind of a, a, a non-intuitive operation, and it's, and that's why these are the the three fundamental operations that one can perform. So, the output is going to be a zero if, uh, just like OR. So, it's think of, think of it as an OR, but it's not the opposite of an OR. Okay. So it's the same as an OR for uh, three cases, one, 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 but the only way it's different is that when the, both the inputs are one, then the output becomes a zero, okay? So you can see that it's not, um, it's, it's not similar to either the AND or an OR. Now, what is referred by the gentleman earlier, which was the opposite of an OR, is actually referred to as a NOR, okay? And it's shown as an OR gate, okay? So this is the OR. And then you put a slight bubble at the end. Okay, the bubble simply means that you are inverting the operation. So this is a NOR, and I haven't shown the NOR operations, but if somebody can tell me what would a NOR look like? If the, these are the inputs A and B, what would the NOR look like? It would be one triple zero. One triple zero, very good. Simply because it's the opposite of the OR, okay? But notice that it's not like the XOR. And what would the NAND look like? So the NAND is simply the opposite of the NAND, of the AND. So it simply takes the AND gate, which is like that, and puts a bubble at the end, because it's supposed to be a circle. So uh, what would uh, the NAND uh, uh, output look like? Anybody? Triple one zero. Uh, triple one zero. Very good, because it's simply the opposite of the AND gate, okay? So that gives you an idea of the, um, you, you might say the five gates that we've shown over here. Okay, and these are logical gates. Uh, internally, how are they actually made? They're made of transistors and electronic circuits. So they would be made of transistors along with resistors, along with voltages, okay? But we don't have to go into the details of every circuit. Uh, if you were a doubly student, you would probably go into that, but not in the computer science course. So now let's move on. And um, these are the, the circuits that I've, that I've shown. Um, now let's take a look at how could one actually use this circuitry to form, to do more complex operations, okay? Now suppose that we want to do an, um, an addition, okay? So basically what we're trying to do is we're taking these two inputs A and B and you want to do a binary addition, okay? Now, um, a binary addition, for example, if you were doing a decimal addition and you had nine and an eight, um, what would that total? You would, well, if you had, for example, a two and a four, when you add these up, you would get a six, right? But when you have a nine and an eight, how would you do the, out the output would clearly be eight, eight, 16, 17, a seven, and there'll be one carried over and you would actually have a one and a seven, okay? So this is, I'm representing this as the sum, okay, over here. The output C is referred as the sum and the D I'm referring to as the carry over, okay? So I'm going to call this as the C and I'm going to call this as D, okay? Now in a binary addition, so let's say if you wanted to add these two numbers together, Clearly, what would be the sum and what would be the carryover? Can somebody tell me? So we're simply taking two bits and we're saying, what's the sum of zero plus zero? What would be zero? It would be zero, zero, and the carryover would also be zero. 
Okay, so it will be zero, zero. Uh, next. One and zero. one zero, the carry would also be zero. So it would be basically a, a zero and a one would be a one and the carry would be zero. If you had a one and a zero, again, the carry or the sum would be zero and this is what you would get. Um, so this would also be a sum of one and the carry over would be a zero. Okay, now what about this? And you had to sum up two numbers, one and one. What would the sum be and what would the carryover be? Zero sum. Zero. Zero and a? So what, this, what would the sum be? Zero one. Zero one. one okay, very good. So the carryover, so because you adding two ones together, the number that we want to get is a one zero, right? Why is that? Because remember, this is in base two. So base two, this uh, a one zero corresponds to a two. Okay. And this is actually the carryover. So this is what we want. This is the operation that we'd like to achieve. Now, the question is, how would one achieve this? So can you think of uh, using these gates to be uh, either the AND gate, the OR gate, or the NOR gate, or the XOR gate, or the NAND gate? to be able to achieve this output. Sir, Mohammed Amar here. G uh, Amar. It would be the XOR gate. Okay, so um, tell me how would you connect that? So you take an XOR gate, very good. So I'm taking an XOR gate. And how would you connect that? Sir, so it would have A and B as the inputs and C would be the output. Okay, A and B as the inputs and C would be the output. Um, why is that? Can you explain that? Uh, sir, A and B are basically the inputs that you have provided as binary. And uh, when it passes through the XOR gate, uh, it applies those rules and the re relative out outcome that we need is uh, carried out into C. Okay, exactly right. So basically this is what we're getting. You can see that this operation 0110 corresponds to 0110 corresponds to the XOR functionality. Okay, so you can see the XOR over here at a 0110 output. Okay, so very rightly said that this is simply the XOR, and what we can do is put an, X, uh, an XOR gate over here. Okay, the XOR gate, we could connect the inputs A and B to it, and we could connect the output to C, the sum. Okay, so this is the sum. Now, what about D? How would we create? Uh, Omar, I'm Zarlish. Zarlish. Connect, uh, uh, let's, let's hear somebody else, Zarlish. Sir, D will be AND. Okay, D would be an AND gate, very good. So you'd simply take D and you would connect A to D, okay? And you'd also take B and you'd connect it to D, okay? And I'm, when I'm putting a, a dot over there, it means that I'm joining these two. Uh, these two are not being joined. So as you saw in the um, in the in the video, uh, you can have circuits overlapping, but they're on different gears. So you can think of these as not all, uh, not actually connected. So A and B, when you're connecting them, so this you can see is simply an AND operation, okay? And you're connecting that to D. So you have zero, 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 and a one, and that corresponds to zero, 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 and one, the AND operation. Okay, so I hope that um, helps people understand how you could actually do a summation. Okay, so we've actually been able to create a simple op um, operation, which is doing two-bit addition. Okay, now if you can do a two-bit addition, you can do more complex additions. Okay, so for example, if you wanted to do a three-bit addition, so let's think about how a three-bit addition would work. Any thoughts on how a three-bit addition would work? So let's say you had uh, three numbers, A, B, and C. And now what we're trying to do is, well, let me create some more space over here. So I'm going to... And let's just create... So this is 
the output that I've just shown you. And I'm going to create a new slide. Let's create this. And now let's try to do a three-bit addition. Okay. So in three-bit addition, basically what we need to do is we need to have um, an A, B, and C. Okay. So how many possible combinations would we have? Any thoughts on that? Eight combinations. Eight combinations, very good. So uh, let's see if we can show the eight combinations. So you would have zero, 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 and then zero, um, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then the whole thing will repeat with a one over here, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, and one, 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 okay? Now, if you wanted to add these, let's say the output consists of a sum, okay? And um, perhaps a carryover, okay? Would that be an appropriate way to do it? So um, if people agree, let's try to do, uh, see if we can do this. So what would be the sum of these three numbers? All three zeros, clearly that would be a zero and the carryover would be zero. Um, I think for these two cases, it's kind of obvious that the sum is going to be a one and the carryover is going to be a zero, okay? Uh, in this case, you can see that uh, clearly the output is going to be what? Can somebody tell me? What's the sum and the carryover? Zero one. Zero. zero one, okay, very good. So this is similar to what we've already done. But this was, this was basically when A was zero and we simply doing the previous two bit addition. Now we're doing a three bit, now A is one, okay? So in this case, hopefully people can see this. This is going to be a one zero. This is going to be uh, similar to this. Okay, so it's going to be a zero one over here. All right. Uh, this is also going to be similar to a zero one, right? Why? Because you only have two ones and you're adding them up together. So the carrier is going to be a one over here. And now what about this case? Three one ones. One. So it's going to be one one. Very good. Why is that? Because now basically what we're saying is that the sum is, the, this corresponds to the number three in decimal and the number three in, in binary is now a one one. Okay. One, two, and one, one. That adds up to a three. So now the question is, how would you create the circuitry? Okay, now that we've understood this, uh, how can somebody give me an idea as to what kinds of uh, what kind of circuitry would you use? Now, what's the what's the difference between what we did earlier and this? So far, we've used uh, gates which have only two inputs. Okay. Now, what do we need to do over here? Any thoughts? We have to use three. We have to use three inputs, okay? But let's say that you don't have gates that can take three inputs. Let's say that we only have gates that can take two inputs. So can you combine these gates together to form, for example, uh, a, a gate that can do an, a, a three, a, a three, um, an and of three inputs, A, B, and C, okay? How do we combine two AND gates so that the output is actually an AND, this operation, A, B, and C, A ANDed with B, ANDed with C, okay? And we simply want to use a two, um, an AND gate, which only has two inputs and one output. Any thoughts? Yes. Uh, G. Sir Daniel here. Yeah. Uh, uh, lower your my uh, your speaker. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, go ahead. G Z. Connect EMB to the end, and okay. then the output of the end EMB would be connected to another end gate. Okay. Where very good. we would input C also. 
Okay. So, so now pe I hope people can see that these two AND gates together are actually now operating as a single AND gate, which is taking three inputs. Okay. So internally, what you've done is taken these two AND gates and combined together. Okay. So now again, the challenge is how do you combine oh. these into an OR gate? So let's think about a single OR gate, which takes three inputs. So sometimes we need that as well. So you can see that uh, we need an OR gate over here, uh, which is taking three inputs. So any thoughts about how to combine A, B, and C into an OR gate, into a three input OR gate by using an OR gate or AND gate? Hopefully that shouldn't be too hard. Any thoughts? So clearly we're going to have one OR gate over here and we can connect A and B to it. Okay. So this is going to be A plus B. How do we connect? Now how do we need, how do we get something C which is A plus B plus C? Sorry, a D over here which is corresponds to A plus B plus C, which is a D. I think it's not too difficult. Any thoughts? Okay, so if we simply do this, will that work? Yes. Right? So if any one of these has a one, the output will be a one. Okay, so you can just check that out a one and a, a zero, zero, a one, zero, zero will result in a one over here and a one and a zero will result in a one over here, okay? Similarly, you can work out that if there's more than one zero, so if there's one, one, one over here, then clearly this will be a one, this will also be a one, and this will output will be a one, okay? So you can combine these um, gates together to form more complex gates, okay? So uh, I think we're almost out of time. Uh, what you need to do is see if you can create a three, um, do this uh, just as um, not an official homework assignment, just, but just for practice and see if you can create circuitry, which will actually do the required uh, uh, operation, which is to do an operation of A um, plus B plus C. Okay, then in other words, uh, sorry, we want to do a three bit addition. Okay, so A, B, and C are three uh, single bit numbers, and we want to add them together. And when they're all ones, we want the sum to be one as well as the carryover to be one. 